Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Scripture says, call upon him when, while he is near. There are people who turned their, eye, turned their ears away when he was near. Later on, they got concerned. He didn't come near again. You don't know. This is that serious. The message of the cross is that serious. Judgment on this world. That was, you want to see what God thinks of this world. You look at the wrath that was poured out upon his own son. People have no idea what it's going to be like when fire falls on this world. And people run screaming. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know why all of a sudden it dawns on them that this has been real. And it's too late. Oh, I want to be in that other crowd that's just surrendered to him here. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Yes. <laughs> because on that day, we're going to be rising into the air and changed in an instant, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. There's a trumpet coming. He's going to appear for his own people, and they're going to be gathered to him in glory. Because we're good people? Oh, no. Because we're sinners saved by the grace of God alone. We turned our backs upon any hope that we could find in our flesh. There's no help in your flesh. There's no help in my flesh. I need a Savior. I need somebody who can come and take hold of my, my rotten self and pull me out of the ditch, pull me out of the pit, set my feet on a rock. That rock is Jesus. 
Oh, he went down into that grave, but just like Naomi said, he promised that, other, that man, other, the other man on the cross, somehow he was unable to see something in Jesus. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Oh, tell you what, he knew what he was doing, and he went, there was, in spite of the agony that he felt, the scriptures tell us there was a joy. Can you imagine having joy in that kind of circumstance? What could he possibly have joy about? Because he wasn't thinking about himself. He was there for God's purpose. He was there to open a door of hope for us, and he saw you, and he saw me, and he was glad. He rejoiced. He might just have seen somebody here who's never thought about this before. It's never dawned on you what it's all about. But Jesus was thinking of you that day when he bore your sins and went into the grave. But oh my God, you think about how the devil would, was triumphing and partying. Man, he thought he'd finally pulled it off. I got rid of him, the world is mine. Oh my, think of what, how, the, how his followers felt. They didn't, they didn't understand, they didn't know what was going on. They were just filled with fear and questions. Some people think they faked it all. Oh my God, they were, they were hiding in fear. They weren't in a position to fake anything. But oh, that first Easter morning when Jesus began to appear to one and then to another and to those on the road to Emmaus, he opened up the scriptures, he showed them what it was all about. You think you can understand the scriptures without the author showing you? No way. The scholars of their day didn't have a clue what it was all about, but Jesus simply opened their eyes, and suddenly there it was. It was in black and white. Yes, everything the, the prophet said, it's come to pass. He bore our sins. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to, to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And even later in that same glorious prophecy in Isaiah 53, you see the hope that it wasn't, that wasn't the end. It wasn't just a dead-end sacrifice. It was something was beyond. He was going to live to see the travail of his soul. He was going to live to see the results. The will of God was going to prosper in his hand. You can go back and read it. And oh, has it. My word, I can imagine the demons in hell just screaming in terror when he came out of that grave. He didn't need anybody to roll that stone away. He just disappeared. He wasn't subject to the laws of nature, of this nature anymore. He had a power way beyond this. My God, he rose to prove that there was something that could absolutely triumph over our worst enemy. That's the one enemy man cannot escape is death itself. It's the ultimate penalty for sin. It's the consequence of sin. You know, I've had this picture a number of times. I can't remember if I've said it in public or not, but I think a lot of people think about sin like there's a God up there who looks down. He's a big bully. He looks down to find out all the things that we enjoy, that we find fun. He says, I need to make a rule about that. And he's just a big killjoy who makes up a bunch of rules for no reason. Let me give you an illustration in the physical world as to what I believe is true in the moral world. There's a law in the physical realm called the law of gravity. You think that's just an arbitrary rule? Or is that the way things work? That's the way things work. So if there is a rule that says, thou shalt not jump off the Empire State Building, is that just a killjoy, purposeless rule? No, it's to stop somebody from violating a law that, that vi the violation of it will destroy them. It's the same with God's moral law. It is a reflection of his being. It is the way the universe works. 
you violate his nature that is one of love and peace and joy and, and occupying with the welfare of others, occupied with the welfare of others. You depart from that and you depart into a, a hell of addiction to, a, to forces that will drive you lower and lower and ultimately destroy you. That's why God is against sin. He knows the end. It may seem like fun for a while, but there is an end, and it's coming, and it's sure, and God loves you enough to say so. Turn away from your own way. Why will you die is his message to man. Look what I have done for you, and look at the Savior I have provided. Is he not able? Has he not proven his ability to do what the Father gave him to do? He who triumphed over, over sin, never let it infect him, never let it cause him to, be, to have his own guilt. He triumphed over in his life. He laid his life down. He put away your sins so that God can be free to forgive you as if your sin never happened. Oh my, you talk about the blood. That's, that's something that can wash any, anything away. Oh, the power. That's p more power than anything in this, any cleanser this world ever thought about. You think about what he has accomplished for us, who we honor today. In his name, we lift up as the savior of the world. But oh, he didn't stop there. Do you know, I've, I've said, I made this point from Romans chapter five a number of times. You know that we're not saved by Jesus' death? Our sins are blotted out because of his death. We are saved by his life. I don't just need a clean slate. I need a new life. If I am left... If I am left with the flesh that I was born with trying to serve God, I will do nothing but fail. I need a brand new life and only a miracle from God can make that happen. And I've got to surrender every effort and every pretense of being right before God. I've got to say, oh God, I am helpless. I need a Savior. Please take my heart and my life. That's what God's, when God confronts your heart, that's what he's looking for. Will you, will you surrender your heart and your life to him and cry out to God to save you? He will hear your cry. He's the one who's, who's calling for it. He's doing it because he loves you. Oh, praise God. That life that came out of that grave, that's the life of God. That's the same life that was in him when he spoke stars into existence. You think he can't do what's necessary to save you and me? He can do whatever it takes. He is able to save completely those who come to God by him because he ever lives to make intercession. I know we sort of, we think of that as he's kneeling somewhere praying for us. That too. But in the context of Hebrews, he's talking about his priestly ministry. In other words, we are not finished products. In our life down here, we are imperfect. We fall short, but we've always got somebody who can go to God and say, there's the answer. I am in a position to intercede for this one who has come short and has failed, but they have put their trust in me. There is the blood. I have offered that blood on the, in a sanctuary of heaven itself, and you accepted that. I'm here to plead their case. Didn't John say, if any man sin, we have an advocate, a lawyer. You got the best lawyer in the universe pleading your case in heaven. If you've ever turned your life over to Jesus, you've got the best lawyer in the universe. Oh, do you have him today? Do you know him? Oh, my. Think about who this is. Just amazed the disciples when they began to interact and realize, hey, this is really so... I mean, you see the state of their, their, their perplexity and, and unbelief because here's Thomas. He wasn't there that day. 
And in spite of all the multiple testimony, he says, I won't believe it. I don't believe it. Doubting Thomas. If I can't put my finger into it, touch the nail prints in his hands and thrust my hand into his side, I won't believe it. Jesus shows up a few days later and says, Thomas, stick your hand in my, you know, calls him on it. Well, Thomas uh, doesn't record that he did that. He just said, my Lord and my God. <laughs> <coughs> I guess you and I would have said the same thing. He was convinced. Oh, you think about his brother James. James knew him all his life. Watched him die, still in unbelief. Didn't have a clue who, G who his own brother was, his half-brother. But somewhere along the line, Jesus, the risen Lord, appeared to James. And James became the pillar of in the leader of the church in Jerusalem. I tell you, we've got every reason in this world to, to know that this Savior is real. Yes, but I'll tell you the way I know the most, you know, we've got the testimony of history, but I'll tell you that what we sang about this morning, he's real because he's here. Yes. This is not emotion and hysteria. This is something that God is witnessing to people's hearts. It's not something you have to feel an exhilaration about. And I'll tell you, there's a peace that can dwell in your heart and your life when you come into a state of rest and surrender to this God and his love. There is a peace that you've never known before that will take root in your heart and in your life. And you'll know that you'll know that he's yours and that come what may, live or die, we're going to be his. We're in his hands. What an awesome privilege it is to know him you know there's a picture that is an amazing one we've referred to a few times in revelation chapter one you know john knew jesus followed him was one of the inner circle during his ministry there were many occasions when it was just peter james and john who were privileged to witness certain events in jesus life one of them was the transfiguration he didn't just see Jesus as a flesh and blood man. He saw him shine like the sun, heard a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son, hear him. Saw Moses, saw all these amazing things. Was there Resurrection Sunday. Was there on Pentecost when, the, when he knew that Jesus had arrived safe in heaven because he said, when I get there, I'm going to shed forth. He did. He shed forth. The Spirit was sent into the hearts of his believers. The church was born on that day. John had been through all of that. He had, in fact, if I remember the timeline right, the reason he was in Patmos to begin with was because they tried to kill him. It didn't work. God had a reason for preserving him. All the other apostles except John died as martyrs. They tried, I think they tried to boil him in oil. They tried to do something. Didn't work. So they said, well, we've got to do something. Let's send him to Patmos. Now, I may have the timeline a little messed up, but that's the essence of it. So here he was waiting on God, and God began to unfold some things to him. But the, the first vision was amazing. Verse, verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. In other words, he looked human. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. That's, you know, cloth that comes like this. His head and hair were white like wool. His as white as snow, his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Wow. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Now, what would you do if you saw something like that. I think you'd do about like John did. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This was more than John could take. 
But what an awesome thing happened then. Then he placed his right hand on thee. Even significance in that. I'm sorry about you, all you southpaws, but there is a significance in using the right hand here. <laughs> then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Does that not tell you something about God? Don't be afraid. All the things that would cause us to tremble with fear before this awesome God. And here he's saying, don't be afraid. It's not what I want. I, don't, I want you to respect me. I want you to understand who I am. But I'm not here to intimidate you. I, want, I don't want you to be afraid. Wow. I can serve somebody like that. I am the first and the last. Think about that. Before anything else was, I was there. Nothing is going to come after me. As nobody's going to be able to stand on the field of battle one day and say, well, that's the rest, rest, that, we're done with him. I'm in charge now. No, no. No enemy's going to triumph over this one. I am the living one. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, look, see, I am alive forevermore, ever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I'll tell you, when Jesus got out, came out of the grave, he didn't escape from some overpowering tyrant, just escape by the skin of his teeth. He walked out of there and he carried the keys with him. He walked out the main gate and took and ripped it off, folks. This is somebody who has the power over your worst enemy, death. If he holds that key, there is nothing that can harm him. Isn't that what he says in Romans 8? What shall separate me from the love of God? Tribulation, all the list of things. Nothing in heaven and earth could possibly do it because he holds the keys. And I'll tell you, he's stretching forth keys right now. There's lives here. You're, you're caught by the power of sin of your own life. You don't realize it. You don't see the end of the road. You think you're, you're so wrapped up in the moment. You don't get it. But God wants to rattle your cage and wake you up and say, I have the keys. I don't want you to die. That's the reason I'm waiting. I don't want you to die. I want you to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I want you to give, to give me your life and let me rescue you because I have a life that won't die. No devil in hell can destroy what I put in you. You can try to serve me all you want and substitute your efforts for mine, and you will fail utterly. You're going to need a miracle from me, but I am willing and able to do what it takes to give you that life. I've got the keys of death and hell. And here we are. Jesus is reigning on high. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to try to go there. You know the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 if you want to read it. But he has been given that place in heaven. Everything's been put under his feet. Everything. That, that was his reward for what he did. Everything is under his feet. He has the authority. But we are in the middle of a process in which he is waging war against every enemy. He's calling people into his kingdom. He's getting them ready but it says when he has brought everything into subjection to him, then he's going to destroy the last enemy. What's the last enemy? Death. Death. When's that destroyed? When he comes. That's when the saying will go forth. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, what a glorious mystery it is that we won't, we know not everybody's going to die. There's going to be a few people that'll be here that'll be, that will rise to meet him when he comes. But if you and I happen to be among those who wind, they put our, they stick our bodies in the ground, nothing to that. I tell you, to die is to go to be with the Lord and then to be united on that day. You know, I have a lot of people ask me a question. I guess they're thinking about the logistics of all this. Where are they? Are they in the grave going to be raised from the dead or are they coming with him from heaven? 
Well, I haven't got it all figured out. I think their bodies are there. Their, you know, their earthly bodies are there and their spirits are with the Lord. I think he can bring the two together however he wants to do it. I'll guarantee you one thing, when he does it, it'll be right. The end result, we'll, we will have a brand new body. It won't just be spirits in a, in a heavenly place. We will be fit to live in a brand new creation that is physical. We'll have the same kind of body that Jesus had when he came out of the tomb. That's what the promise of God. Look, we read that last week in Philippians chapter 3. But oh, what a glorious promise to those who know him. And what a call to those who need him. Oh, my. If there's somebody that needs him, you need to call his, upon his name this morning. Not on the strength of emotion, not on the strength of words that I speak, but the words that God speaks to your heart. You can, you can reach out to him with all of your heart right where you're sitting. Doesn't have to be a special method or a ceremony or anything, but if you will, if you will simply from your heart say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I surrender. I put my faith in you. God will save you. It's not a method. It's an encounter with the living God who is on your trail because he loves you and wants to turn you from the way that leads to death. That's the whole thing. That's what this day is about. That's what our Savior is about. He who was our creator became our savior, became, has become our Lord and our elder brother who, with whom we will live for an eternity, worshiping our heavenly father. All of this that's wrong with this world will be done away. Don't perish with it. If you choose your own way, you will. But God loves you. And if you're one in that category, hear his voice. And say yes, you will never, ever regret it. Your eyes will be opened. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they've been born again. That's what it takes. When God takes the veil from your eyes and you see, you will look back and you say, how could I have been such a fool? How did I miss it? How did I not see? That's the state this world is in. They do not see. They have been blinded, rendered blind by the enemy of their souls. But I'll tell you, we have somebody who can open eyes. We have someone who has the power against everything that's wrong with your life. He's the only one that can rescue you. Call upon his name. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise God. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD, or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.